what we have done for the q and a session is that we have asked you know an actual practitioner of you know uh, dewatering or sludge management to do the questioning for us i would now like to invite mr ajit salvi the executive engineer with mcgm you know which is the municipal corporation of greater mumbai uh, mr salvi is a key member of the msdp the mumbai sewage disposable project and he has been a leading uh, i would say or he's been the key driver behind you know majority of the uh, sewage and wastewater projects in mumbai uh, dr salvi yes sir thank you sir kailash sir thank you uh, first of all uh, let me thank uh, dr julia pop and dr bill warbar for nice presentations say uh, let me clear before i start with the question answer session dr julia and dr bill warbar please see that we have received so many question uh, you can see in your question and answer uh, box also and along with that we have received some of the questions on email and that i am going to just uh, uh, try to take in our this question and answer session see uh, to be very frank see liquid uh, treatment and then solid treatment so lot a lot many thing is already talked and already discuss about the liquid treatment but the sludge treatment is comparatively uh, new to the developing countries and that is the reason we have received some of the generalized question about the sludge management and uh, the sludge treatment so for the benefit of the participant for the benefit of the participant who are listening our webinar we will try to take take this all these questions which will be benefited to all participants and it will enhance their knowledge so uh, i i will kindly request dr julia pop and bill barber please answer the questions as per your specialization the first question i can say it is addressing to both the experts and the question is what if what are the trends you are seeing with request to the biosolid management so see because as i said ki this biosolid management is comparatively new uh, trend and we are talking particularly in india also uh, uh, treatment of the biosolid is nothing but what just uh, drying it and use it for the uh, as a uh, uh, for the fertilizer or anything else without any further treatment so what you what you expect what will be the future trend in this biosolid management uh, bill you can uh, go ahead uh, thank you very much um it's it's an interesting question there have been obviously things have changed uh, for, over the years drivers have changed so if you look back maybe 20 years or so ago there was a concern about application to land there were foot and mouth disease there were scare stories in the newspapers uh, you know the scare stories all oh, human sewage being put on the land and then food and so a lot of people were being put off land application of sludge. So 20 years or so ago, you saw a big trend towards um, moving away from that outlet. So a lot of incineration, thermal treatments, uh, you know, to minimize volume of sludge and go away from that. Having said that, if you move forward, say, eight, set, about eight years ago, there was a big spike in oil price, uh, sorry, in 2007, 2008. Uh, the cost of um, phosphorus and nitrogen fertilizer massively went up, and then that made people rethink, you know, the value of uh, biosolids in a more circular economy way. So people started looking more towards perhaps going back to land is is a preferable thing. Also, from respect to saving money and from an environmental perspective. So you know, I have a lot of my experience in the UK. If you look at the UK water industry. It moved from drying and incineration in the early 2000s more towards digestion for renewable energy recovery and application to land. Now, that, that is in, in the UK and other parts of Central Europe, the regulations preventing land application. So if you look at uh, Germany, for instance, that there's incineration. So I think it very much depends on the local regulations, but I think where there's a choice, it, there's more emphasis towards land application. I think biosolids management has a lot to do with risk management. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and then suddenly that outlet is closed overnight. So it's, it's, it's managing risk and knowing how to spend your money wisely so you are managing long-term risk. But I, I think 
the more we go forward and the more carbon footprint and um, is, is in the news, the more we are moving towards land application, if it's possible. Yes, uh, uh, a really uh, nice thing. Uh, before I talk something, Dr. Julia, you want to add something? Please add. Yes, of course. I think uh, if you are in the community, build up new ways for the people to be able to learn and be introduced in a new part of technology to immutable treatment process. First of all, you have to use all the waste water treatment, and then you have a trust in such a biosolid management. And what we see all over the world is that all treatment plants are growing systems. You learn something, you build something, and then you try to adjust it every time. So it's a patchwork situation. And if you are in possibility, as I hear from, um, from India, build up new processes and make a very smart design. And uh, 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 sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Your voice is not clear. Huh? Just check. <laughs> yes, so, uh, Dr. Copy, your voice is not clear. Uh, it's better now? Uh, yes, yes. Yes. Right. yes. Okay. If you could repeat uh, uh, what you just it. said. So the main message uh, is you have, you're in a bit good position to skip all these lessons learned. You have, have no patchwork solution like in other other countries and you are able to implement very effective technology. And in my opinion, um, the way from Germany to insulate anything, it's a bit difficult, so I can really um, use biosolid with a good quality for agriculture use, it will be a good way, not to waste nutrients for the biosolid. So yes, to be very frank, we have to make some changes in a uh, total concept-wise changes is required. So uh, particularly we one should think that biosolids are nothing but it is an energy source. We can get lots of nutrients from that and all other things. Particularly, as I said, in developing countries, it was treated like a waste only. So that total thinking has to be changed. And uh, this is a need of an hour. And that is what. Thank you, Dr. Bill Barbal and Dr. Julia. Uh, see, uh, if continuing with the, all this aspect, if what you think, if particularly, uh, uh, Dr. Bill Barbal, you can talk about how can the energy demand of the thermal hydrolysis be reduced if in continuation with the energy requirement? Yes, thank you. Um, as, I, as I briefly mentioned, uh, that uh, the, there are alternative configurations. So, uh, with normal thermal hydrolysis, the primary and waste activated sludge thermally hydrolysis in, in combination, uh, th there is a small uh, parasitic load, even if you have a recovery with, with uh, cogeneration. This load is somewhere between 1% and 3% equivalents of, of your biogen. Having said that, the, the amount of energy you need for thermal hydrolysis is fundamentally dependent, and again, this goes to Julia Cox's comments, what you do in the wastewater treatment plant fundamentally impacts what happens in the sludge side. So the, the more primary sludge you have, the better the energy balance, ironically, even though there's more impact on the waste activated sludge. So, so what happens is if I have primary sludge, if primary sludge is more than about 75%, then there is no parasitic load, even if I'm treating all of the sludge. So the more waste activated sludge I have, the, the worse, the more parasitic load. Having said that, there are many instances where primary and waste activated sludge are thickened separately. This research has shown that, the, as, as Dr. Copper said, most of the issue with sludge management is, is the management of activated sludge, not the management of primary sludge. So if you thicken the material separately, you can put the thermal hydrolysis only on the waste activated sludge. So you get the vast majority of the benefits, but you're only treating half of the sludge. So in that case, you are energy sufficient and you get most of the benefit. There are other configurations where you can put it downstream of digestion before a second set of digestion. So you digest first, then you have the less biodegradable material coming out. That is thermally hydrolyzed, and then you digest it again. Uh, that will eliminate the parasitic load. And as I mentioned briefly, um, putting thermal hydrosis downstream will also eliminate the load as well. So you can manage the energy balance by using different configurations, but these configurations depend on site-specific parameters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.
See, uh, uh, one perhaps, more question. Perhaps, perhaps I can add a comment to this. No so, problem. Yes, sir. Welcome. If you use mechanical thickening device, so you can treat less volume by good thickening, short ways in pipes for the big sludge, um, the, the energy consumption is much lower. So an increase could be to improve the BS before THP. So you can use the digestion volume as good as you can. That can be a good suggestion. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, madam. See, uh, uh, one more question uh, to Dr. Julia, madam. See, there is a specific question related to chlorides and sulfates. So, how does the increased content of the chlorides and sulfates affect the dewatering of the biosolids? Because this, this question is from uh, one really ongoing tender and all. See, in some of the cases where it is near to the seashore and all, and there is a possibility of the more sulfates and more chlorides are expected. So whether there is any, uh, uh, is there any effect on the dewatering of the biosolids of this chlorides and sulfate? Yeah, so first of all, chloride is a mono, monovalent um, anion and uh, it will change a high presence of chloride will change the flock structure. So you will get small particles and at least you have a higher surface charge and you have a big effect on polymer conditioning itself. So I have to explain in the third part of this webinar the uh, polymer preparation and there's an interaction between the chloride and the polymer. So why a question of conditioning. And sulfate, um, it's not so, so big influence on the watering and conditioning itself. But on the other hand, if you have a digestion step, sulfate is an oxygen um, compound and you have to reduce it in digestion. And you have to look for the biogas quality and for the digestion in advance, for the anaerobic digestion. So after anaerobic digestion, sulfate is not a topic. It's a topic for the digestion, but a high electric conductivity and a chloride concentration can affect the conditioning itself. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Say, in connection with the, this particular question, there is another question to Dr. Bill Barber. How does the polymer usage in thermal hydrolysis affect the dewatering of the biosolids? Yeah, there's, there's, there are a lot of variables, as, as uh, Dr. Kopp has mentioned, that the consumption yes, of yes. polymer is, is, is influenced by many, many variables. There are some things that thermal hydrolysis does that, that increase would you'd expect to increase uh, polymer demand. For example, the release of proteins, uh, you know, the more proteins in solution, you can uh, that interferes with the polymer and it can increase polymer demand. So there are, there's certainly things that solubilizes more materials and these materials can interfere with polymer and increase the, the demand on a unit basis. Having said that, there are things that, are, you know, it does other things which reduce the polymer consumption. So it destroys the extracellular materials, which also interfere. The VS destruction is enhanced as less volatile solids. Um, so it makes things more biodegradable, which has an impact on, on the dewater, but also on the polymer consumption. So it's, it's difficult to say. There are many variables that which, which would suggest the polymer demand goes up and others which suggest it would go down, so from a theoretical perspective. Having said that, when there's been data in the field, it, is, it depends very much on jar testing and the type of polymer you use in the field. There's very little, you know, there's the, the differences in the noise. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, David Hume, for example, there's a lot of published data there. They have the dosage rates of about uh, eight or nine kilograms Per, per active substance per ton of dry solids, which is what if you know that which is kind of in the correct range. So I think it's that's like specific, uh, you know, where there's been site data, it doesn't suggest that there's fundamentally higher. I think if you want to be conservative, you can for calculations, you can assume it would be a little bit higher per, on a unit basis. But having said that. Um, you're dewatering less material because the higher VS, less biosolids coming out, so you, you have less polymer consumption. 
The main polymer consumption, I would suggest, is in the pre-thickening stage prior to thermal hydrolysis, where there's definitely higher, because you're looking at a high dry solid. Uh, yes, thank you. Could, could uh, elaborate on this. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Bill. See, uh, one more kind of connect, uh, connected question with the uh, thermal hydrolysis only. How can the thermal hydrolysis process assist in selection of the dewatering equipments? Uh, yes, we, we've been uh, working with certain suppliers of uh, dewatering equipment. Uh, it, it, you have sludge which has different characteristics. It's far more compressible. Um, some utilities have been doing a lot of work on this. Uh, I know Thames Water and DC Water have been doing a lot of work. And it makes, because the sludge is not far more compressible, may suggest that say, a belt type uh, dewatering device may be preferable for whole life costs. Um, having said that, that, I would say three quarters of all the full scale, full scale installations are using centrifuge dewatering. And the other 25% is a mixture of belt presses and piston presses. We're seeing Buka presses uh, coming into play now more recently where you can get higher dry solids again. So it's really, um, it, it, it makes the dewatering better irrespective of the dewatering device. Um, and it really comes down to prefer, you know, a personal preference of the client. So they, if someone's got many centrifuges, they may want to stick with centrifuges because it's easy. they understand the operation and maintenance and uh, for training their staff. They may prefer equipment that they're, you know, they're used to. But you know, potentially, if you're building a new plant from scratch, a belt press may give equal performance to a centrifuge with lower whole life costs potentially. So yeah, it, it depends uh, on the detail, or it delves in the detail. Thank you, thank you. There is, uh, as you mentioned something about the operation and maintenance also, there are some questions related to that. But uh, before going to that, uh, that particular question, there is uh, one more question to Dr. Julia. Uh, it is, a, they want their opinion. What is your opinion about the WWTP, wastewater treatment plant, without primary clarifier? in relation to the dry swat solid after dewatering? So, if it's not necessary to... to ah. um, it's, everything will be easier if you have a pre-treatment tank. Ah. So, we have yes. a more primary, you have um, easy to degradable sludge and yet you will not build with a COD compounds and wastewater, more waste than the sludge. But the size of the clarifier not dependent on sludge treatment. The size of the clarifier depends on your um, goals to achieve by nit denitrification and phosphorus removal. So it's yes, yes, on, yes. The, uh, on the values on the effluent of the wastewater treatment plant. But to say, oh, it's much easier to build up only a aeration tank, it will be much more expensive because you need to aerate more wastewater and to regenerate more COD, BOD. So if it's possible, build a um, primary settling tank to get an, um, good results on sludge treatment as well for biogas production. A biogas production from a primary is twice as high um, than comparing to waste activated sludge without DHP. So, the return flow by nitrogen after digestion is three times higher for waste activated sludge than for primary. So there's a good reason to, to first fit the system for wastewater treatment. And if you have the opportunity, use a primary settling tank, and then you have to adjust the sludge treatment on the sludge behavior you find um, as a result of your wastewater treatment process. And of course, can do everything you like, but it will be much more expensive if you are uh, produced only waste activated sludge. Yes, okay, okay. So it is a connection having the cost, cost implication is also there. Uh, yep. Yes, uh, again, uh, to Dr. Julia only, see, there is a one more uh, uh, specific question. Are there any example with the co digestion of the organics with the sludge? Yes, there are examples by co-digestion and it strictly depends which co-substrate you use and yes. which the freight of this co-substrate. So if you use fat, 
digestion without DHP. They will eat all the fat and digest and digest uh, the fat. They, they will eat compounds from primary and at least if they found nothing else, they will uh, digest um, the waste activated sludge compounds and the proteins. Therefore, an, an add on a fat and easy to degradable co-substrate can reduce the waterability. So okay. it depends which one you use and how much you use and how long is your retention time. On the other hand, if you use a co-substrate with a lot of fibers, it could increase the dewaterability. So the question is not what is the end fact, the question is what is the substrate? Such things are in existing in Germany. I think I heard somewhere in Denmark it is happening. There uh, are some existing plants for co-digestion in Austria as well as in Germany. And ah. um, that's a, it's a construction and, and normally the sludge of the dewatering will be burned and that's a way to reduce food waste. Um, but on the other hand, if you have a fiber material or co-digestion, I, I believe Kambi has some experience by thermal treatment of uh, a plant behavior or something like this uh, for co-substrate pretreatment. Perhaps Bill can tell something to this. Yes, okay. Uh, Bill, Dr. Bill, you want to add something? Yeah, so we've certainly got experience of co-digestion. We, uh, of all of the facilities, maybe 10 to 15% of them have some kind of organic material. And there's one a big plant in Oslo with source separated organics. Uh, as Dr. Coppers mentioned, we, we've been looking at these uh, fibrous materials. as well. We've been doing a lot of testing there. We're seeing a lot of interest in co-digestion with thermal hydrolysis, mainly in Asia Pacific region. and. Uh, Korea and places like this. Um, and obviously in, in uh, Scandinavia, there's a lot of uh, co-digestion where, and uh, the point where the fertilizers, new, the, the digestate is used as a fertilizer, but also the biogas is, doesn't go through a cogen, but goes through an upgrading system, a biomethane system, and then goes into fuel for buses. So more like a circular economy kind of thing. So. The things to consider with co-digestion of thermohydrosis is the operating temperature. A lot of these materials are far more biodegradable than sludge. So you don't really need to go as high in terms of the temperature. Um, and, and, and also there's a concern potentially about interactions between sugars and proteins in, in the food, which can generate these materials which are non-biodegradable. So that's something that you need to consider as well. Yes, yes, thanks. Interesting, very interesting. See, uh, now this uh, another particular question is a very uh, specific and related to site specific question to both the experts. Say, particularly, uh, availability of the sufficient land is a major issue in our metro cities, particularly India. And I'm talking about Mumbai. See, everything is available, land is not available. That is the issue. If you consider this particular aspect, so what are your recommendations for handling of the biosolids totally in, in, in general? Uh, Dr. Julia, you can start. Um, it could be a good idea to have a very compact system. So you, uh -huh. you can use very deep pools and uh, tanks for the aeration. Perhaps you, you use the clarifiers and add the filtration. So you need less clarifiers for the wastewater. Afterwards, I will suggest to make a pretty watering as high as possible and a very short way to thermal treatment, a very short digestion time. And afterwards, perhaps you use a centrifuge. It could be a very compact system. And for example, there are some new processes. You combine the centrifuge with drying in one unit, and then you get a good fertilizer. You, you can um, um, pass all these uh, classification for fertilizing and class A. So there will be a way to do it, but not only the place, you have to use this very complex and compact system with a good operation and survive. So you need automatization, education to, to bring it in, uh, in, the, in the running system. Uh, Dr. Bill, Bill? Yes, I, I, I'd agree with a lot of what Dr. Kopp has said. I think you are looking to uh, enhance the capacity of your plant. So really, you want high rate activated sludge treatment processes, you know, using carrier material or some means of keeping the sludge in there for longer for shorter retention time. 
uh, obviously with the digestion, you know, looking at hydrolysis or something else, anything that can minimize the size of the digestion part is going to be favorable. And in terms of the biosolids application, anything, again, which improves the dewaterability and the, the BS destruction will result in the least amount of material uh, leaving the site, irrespective of whether you land, fill it or incinerate it or whatever. You know, a good example of, of somewhere in the world which has got very little land is Hong Kong. So looking at Hong Kong, there's a lot of mountains there. Real estate is amongst the highest in the world. Just this month, they've, they've um, put out a note saying that they're going to go for thermal hydrolysis of their sludge in Hong Kong, uh, digestion thermal hydrolysis, then followed by incineration. So, you know, that, that's an example of where the technology is used in a very densely populated area with little land availability. Um, and also the issue there is there's a high salinity in the sludge as well. So even if the land were available, it's, um, there's not much outlook for the, for the bio. Yes, it's, see the point is what, see, particularly uh, there is an issue, all the uh, local bodies, uh, they are in trouble as the uh, controlling authorities are coming with the you know, very stringent standards uh, for, for the treatment. And at the same time, there is an unavailability of the land and all, all problems are there. So that is the reason the technology providers and the experts in the field, it is their duty that they, they should come with the new technologies and new concepts so that the purpose can be solved and the total environment can be protected. That is the idea. Say, in connection with that, as a, a, a Dr. Barber was talking about the operation maintenance and all, say, particularly in a, a India, country like a India and all, what I found or what is my experience is what? The operation and maintenance, this is what somewhat neglected issue. Once the, the uh, installation is done and it is commissioned, uh, some of the installations are failed only because of the operation and maintenance aspect. So uh, restricting to the discussion to the biosolids and dewatering of uh, uh, concept only, my question is what is rather than the one of the participants, he asked the question, the keeping in the mind the recurring cost of the operation and maintenance, it is a very huge com uh, compared to the the uh, capex cost. What uh, what care should be taken at the time of design of the dewatering system? Uh, Doctor Pop, you can start with this, and then uh, Doctor Barber can add. Um, I'm not sure if I understand completely the question, but I try. So, if you design a dewatering device, the first question is um, how many hours you can run the device. And you need a bit of uh, extra capacity, but at least if you have a full automatic process, you can use a device running 20 hours a day. And so you can adjust the loading to the sludge properties and it's much better than uh, using only a, a dewatering device for eight hours a day. So if you in, in invest more money in an automatic um, performance, you can run it quite easy and use it for the whole time. Therefore, the units get smaller, but at least not too small. So uh, uh, um, if you look to the cost, the disposal cost, it is necessary to buy a bigger machine and running it in, a, in a, a various time. So running it 20 hours a day, and only if you say it's nominated for 40 cubic per hour, use it for 20, 25. Um, because else you need much more polymer and everything gets very nasty. So first of all, you have to decide the operation hours and then you need a redundant system. That means two lines and a high amount of automatization, then that um, could run quite well. And at least don't be too uh, jealous to the money. Um, the <laughs> operation depends on <laughs> For example, polymer. Polymer is a cost that's, that's as, um, uh, accumulated over the years. So if you make the process stable, if you feed a machine with kilo dried solid power, so you need, a, you need an online measuring system for the DS and the incoming of the machine, nevertheless, this, uh, a belt or centrifuge, and then use the right polymer dose. And this is a minimum you need to make a good performance for sludge dewatering. And then you have to decide the operation hours per day. 
Okay, okay. Yeah, I agree. I think a good control system and the automation can also help in that. Okay, Doctor Barwan, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I'd agree with everything Doctor Cox said. I, I certainly polymer is expensive. Anything you can do to reduce polymer consumption, whether it's online instrumentation, I think is is hugely beneficial. Uh, as I said before, you know, typically historically more centrifuges were used with thermohydrosis because of the superior perform superior performance typically compared to a belt um, with, on, or, on ordinary sludge. Uh, so people were just stuck with centrifuges because they had them. But as a lot of testing has shown, as the, um, because the sludge becomes much more compressible, the performance across the watching devices becomes very similar. So that, that advantage seems to go away. But then it becomes down one of choosing the dewatering equipment based solely on the whole life operating cost in terms of the polymer consumption, uh, the operating hours, and, and the operator input. You know, the, the, uh, and but again, it comes back to what we talked about a moment ago. You know, belts may have a larger footprint, so you know you may need far more footprint to fit your belts than an equivalent centrifuge system. Um, talking a little bit you know, in a bigger envelope, more towards the hydrolysis and digestion. Typically, what we're seeing is when you put hydrolysis and digestion together, the overall operating costs on the existing plants are approximately half of those where there's only digestion. And that's including even all the liquid treatment costs and all of that. So that's obviously a, a, a geographical thing. So that, that there's that difference is different in different parts of the world, depending on the value of the gas, the value of the recycling, and, and the, the cost of polymer and stuff like this. But it's typically all of some, it's around about 40 to 50% of the cost uh, of, of not having the hydrolysis system there. Even, if, even though the cost is made up of far more variables. Hey, uh, let me, participants are listening. There are lots of questions and this session is continued. So I want to give the assurance to the all participants. Though all questions are not attended here, but you will get the answers of the all question through email at least, not in a uh, live webinar, but you will get the answer through email. But we are trying to get, uh, trying to cover more and more questions and our experts are there to answer the thing. Uh, Kailas, you can uh, interrupt as per your time, huh? please. There is a, uh, I'm just taking no, some sir, questions. Uh, we have enough time. No, no, we have no, some yeah. time because both the presenters were <laughs> very economical with their time in presentation. So we yes, have some yes. time. Sir, I have a particular question that has come up. Maybe it's for Bill. Uh, Bill, the question is, how do you compare low temperature THP technologies against high temperature THPs in view of energy usage and neutrality. Yeah. Yes, of course. So, so yeah, but there, are, there are lots of hydrolysis systems which run at different temperatures. So a lot of the ones which run at a lower temperature are combined with something else. So, for example, I think uh, Julia Kopp mentioned one of these before. You know, you could have a lower temperature, let's say 100 degrees C, uh, plus chemicals. Uh, so you have a combination of thermohydrolysis plus chemical hydrolysis. Obviously, with the thermohydrolysis, the higher the temperature, the, 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 the greater the extent of hydrolysis. You know, if I ran at 300 degrees C, that's by far the best, but then you can't do anything with the liquid but, and, and the energy balance. So it's, it's a case of looking at the energy balance. Um, but as I said before, obviously, the lower the temperature, it, it's, it's a fact of the type of sludge you have. The more waste activated sludge, the, the, the greater the energy I need to heat it up uh, because of its uh, rheological properties and its uh, specific heat capacity. Um, so the more wires I have, the higher the energy content. And the more dry solids I have, the lower the energy content, hence having the free thickening upstream. So for example, uh, heating at a higher temperature high dry solids and may actually use less energy than heating at a lower temperature with a lower dry solid because the vast majority of the energy you need is to heat the water. Um, so it really, you would need to work it out depending on the quantity, the, the, the dry solids content, type of sludge, and, and how efficient the system is at retaining heat. So you're looking at, the, if you look at the technologies of black box, whether it's low or high temperature, whatever, 
you're heating the difference between the temperature going in and the temperature coming out. And, and so what comes into play there is how much of the temperature you're recycling within the system. So the delta T becomes an important variable. So you'd have to calculate that on a, on a case by case basis. But as I mentioned before, the, the energy balance in the biogas is, is of less importance than other variables. You know, so um, I, perhaps it'd be a useful talk for next time, but if you look at the economics of running a thermal hydrolysis plant, people are always look at the energy costs and the energy. So everyone's focused on increasing the dry storage to reduce the steam, to reduce the gas demand. But when you actually look at the costs overall as a percentage of the whole operating cost, it might be 5% or less. Things like polymer are far more significant in cost than, than, than energy for heating. You know, people don't realize that, but when you look at the, the additional variables, the electricity and all other stuff, it's actually not a lot, the energy. Uh, so it's important to be aware of it, and we're always trying to keep the energy down by having different configurations, but it's often over, its importance is overestimated, that's for that, when you look at the actual numbers. And you do detailed economic analysis. Okay. Perhaps I can give a comment to this too. Okay. So, if you look to the chemical thermal process with 65, 70 degrees Celsius, so it's come from the histories. You have an existing wastewater treatment plant, existing sludge management system. You want to implement um, the thermal hydrolysis. You want to, you are not. Um, willing to buy a uh, stream production or a heat exchanger. So you can use the excess heat from your gas machines. You will achieve 65, 70 degrees, that's it. And then to improve the, t the thermal hydrolysis process is necessary to add caustic soda. So this process is not um, built up for a new greenfield treatment plant. Um, this process is built to and add on on existing treatment plants. So you have to decide by yourself, um, I'm a, am I afraid about steam or not? That's a, it's a big, big trouble uh, in Germany, for example. They are not so um, um, agree with stream treatment. On the other hand, if you build up everything new, everything compact, you can fit it all together. It could be much more interesting to treat both the primary and the waste activated sludge by thermal treatment process to build smaller digesters. If you had a big old digester and enough retention time, you want to improve your dewatering. Then you decide how to um, pick up the right process. So there's a wrong or right. It's only a fits or fits not for a certain project. And the question, the temperature, you, you don't decide how to manage the temperature. The temperature level is a question of what you could achieve to uh, realize with your um, uh, excess heat, for example, or how much steam you need. And if you say much is more, that's not right. If the temperature is too high, the denaturation is so strong that the biodegradability will reduce at least and the increase of uh, return flow increase too. So for this, for the combi process, THP or other processes, this 150 degrees Celsius is uh, quite common. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Barbara, there is a one question, a very interesting it one. What is the experience with the post-digestion THP? And what is the impact on dewatering? Yes, uh, so there's quite a bit of experience with the post-digestion. As I mentioned before, historically, it was just a dewatering aid. And now having it as post-digestion is, is pretty much going back to its roots as a dewatering aid again. So, so typically what research found that if you digest, if you thermally hydrolyze raw sludge, you could easily get 50 to 60 percentage points. And that by digesting it, a lot of the materials that you've destroyed in the thermal treatment then are reintroduced through via a bacterial activity. And then this drops your dewaterability by 20 points or so. So if you went from 50 and after digestion, it's 30, which is still several points higher than if you weren't doing it at all. So by doing it downstream, a number of challenges doing it downstream. Ideally, you want to keep everything as hot as possible. 
and and use hot polymer, which which goes against all the textbooks about about using polymer uh, because it starts breaking down the polymer. But what we see is again, it depends on the the, the configuration. So in plant near Germany, uh, in um, but near near Munich that Dr. Koch mentioned, there is a plant that has this configuration at full scale, and you take the liquid fraction, which is high biodegradable COD you recycle that back to the digester to improve the VS destruction. So VS destruction goes up to about 70 to 75%. <clears throat> and the dewatering now is uh, about between 40 and 50%. And, and you can change the settings, if you will, to, to manipulate uh, the dewaterability. So that, that plant is prior to an incinerator uh, offsite. <clears throat> The Chinese have been doing a lot of research in this area as well, where they've been looking at uh, uh, post-digestion uh, uh, thermal hydrology. It seems to be getting a lot more traction now as an, as, as an option, especially where Class A is not a driver. Unfortunately, this configuration, by its definition, will be difficult to meet Class A in the US, um, because in the US, it's, Class A is a combination of time temperature of treatment and vector attraction reduction, which is basically a fancy way of saying stabilization. An example of that is digestion or liming. So in the US, you have to do the time temperature first and then the stabilization. The issue with putting thermohydrosis downstream is that it's downstream the stabilization. So unless you further drive it to 70%, which is possible, there's work in China where they've increased the temperatures even more of the thermohydrosis and using Buka press, uh, piston press, you can get 70% dry solids uh, using that configuration. So I think it's becoming more of interest, especially where it's before drying systems or incinerators, because you're making much less volume, much higher dry solids, and keeping the energy content high in the, in the bio solids. Okay, uh, there is a specific question to Dr. Paul. Uh, See, the other than a question, it is they want your suggestion or recommendation. Are there any sludge enhancement pre dewatering technologies that you can highlight and which are particularly efficient? Um, so, for pre dewatering, the energy consumption with centrifuge is the lowest in compared to a belt or screw thickener. And the trouble uh, by thickening is that. Um, the, the operation of the machine is not so easy because the operation due to the torque regulation, the torque isn't very low, it's quite low, but you can use a pre-dewatering and re-dilute to the BS you would like to achieve and this will be very, very effective. So in this opinion, um, centrifuge are mostly useful to go to this higher dewatering level because you can uh, need less um, polymer comparable to other pre-thickening units. And the other question is the capture rate you would like to achieve. For example, if you have a two-stage digestion system, so make a digestion of only a waste-activated sludge, um, make pretty watering, you have a sludge liquor with a high amount of uh, phosphorus, you can use this for phosphorus recovery, but to use it as phosphorus recovery is necessary to have a good capture rate, and this is, could be a trouble if you use a screw press or something else. So in my opinion, um, if you talk about the systems, you talk about big treatment plants, not about treatment plants with 20,000 popular equivalents, so the only not the small ones, and for the big one, um, the flexibility of centrifuge is quite good, but using only centrifuge for pre-thickening or pre-watering, it could be easier to dewater and re-dilute to the DS you use because the operation um, is not exact by thickening or not so comfortable like for dewatering and the polymer consumption could be lower. Uh, one more question again. Uh, it is expected that some neutral answer is expected. So Dr. Pop, you can answer this question. Uh, the question is, is ha having extended activated sludge process better for management of biosolids as it does not produce much waste? Which is the more economical extended aeration or they are asking whether to go for THP? 
Can I repeat so, the question? Perhaps. So the question is, if you have only waste activated the sludge, which prefer which process we prefer for aeration? Extended. Yes, yes. Or they they are saying whether to go for THP. Um, so the aeration um, is necessary if you are very energy safe in aeration. You can be sure you will have an enhanced biological pre removal without any control, but. The, the, I, have to, I have to look for the English word. Um, the membrane uh, aeration system is quite good, but it's mostly a question of the deep of your aeration tanks you use. And um, I'm not an expert on aeration as well. Um, so I have to look for the word. But first of all, perhaps I have, I have for thought back to the solid stream um, THP process after digestion. We, we did a lot of work with this treatment plant close to Munich. And um, in our opinion, you have a heat dewatering. So the hot dewatering process in the last step. So it's no big clue to make a um, drying just afterwards. Or in my opinion, it could be a good idea to make compostation afterwards. So then you will achieve a class A performance and then it could fit quite well. And um, the English word for um, to the aeration system will be ceramic as aerators could be quite effect effective. If you have deep, deep, deep um, um, aeration tanks, we talk about eight meters deepness like this. Uh, yes, okay, okay, I agree. See, uh, uh, Dr. Bill, see, we have already talked about the energy, but there is a one more question, again related to energy only, and that is particularly related to thermal hydrolysis. So, please, you can uh, repeat uh, again, how to manage the need of high amount of energy to provide the steam for this process? So, as, as I showed before on, on the graph, on the, on the slide, there, there is an energy demand, and this energy you can get from many, many different ways. So the easiest way to get it is to divert biogas into a boiler. So if you do that, you're losing about a quarter of your biogas. On a, you know, as a rule of thumb for, for mixed sludge, this is not for just pure waste activated sludge. Uh, but that's not a very efficient way to do. So if you have a cogeneration plant, you have, you, you generate electricity and you have high and low grade heat, waste heat. The high grade heat you can recover and use that energy to offset the steam demand. Then, as I showed, that will offset maybe 90% of that 25%. So that still leaves a 5% uh, external. So that additional 5%, you can then use natural gas in a boiler or, or any other en energy source, but typically natural gas. Then it becomes a question of. Um, of economics is that biogas you produce is that worth more as renewable electricity or, or is natural gas more expensive typically um, it's prudent to design your your boilers and gas systems to be able to burn multiple fuels whether it's biogas or natural gas and then you can manipulate the operation uh, depending on the daily gas prices so typically from, an, from a, an environmental perspective, let's say it makes more sense to use biogas, but from a financial perspective, it makes more sense to use natural gas because natural gas is, is far cheaper than the value attributable to, to renewable energy from biogas. Thank you. Thank you. See, uh, let me take one more, two, three question more, which is a very generalized. Uh, Dr. Kopp again, uh, there is a question can you comment on the influence of the temperature on dewatering? Yes, there's big influence on temperature on dewatering. So if you are able to water your sludge warm, the, the temperature level of your digestion, everything is fine. If you, if you forget it in a thickener uh, or storage tank and it's cooled down under 20 degrees Celsius, the viscosity of your sludge increase and therefore the dewaterability decrease slightly a bit too. So you, the water needs more time to leave the sludge uh, flock structure. So there is an influence, but if you get the, nearly the same level between digestion and dewatering is quite interesting. It could be quite interesting to make a vacuum degassing to put all these release biogas out and get um, compact sludge cake. 
But on the other hand, if you say the higher temperature, lower viscosity leads to better dewatering results, you have to take care to the polymer itself. So the polymer gets in trouble by 50 degrees plus. So it's not a good idea to prepare a polymer with too hot water or to increase um, the temperature up to more than 50 degrees Celsius. That's one of the trouble we have to learn by operation this zombie solid stream process. So um, the, the, the main topic you can keep in your mind is don't lose the temperature te level after dewatering, but it's not necessary to preheat more um, the process. Good, okay. Uh, one more question to, uh, again, Dr. Koch. In a wastewater treatment design, for a total phosphorus removal, less than one milligram per liter. Yes. Do, do we need to go for thickening and dewatering in separate steps? This is what they ask. Um, normally, you have to set, uh, okay. Phosphorus removal to a, to a value less than one milligram per liter is a state of technology in Germany and Europe. And of course, you need some precipitation in the effluent to reduce and therefore the phosphate level is lower comparable to for sludges from US. And the, uh, the I'm, I'm not sure you mean you need a, a separate step for handling phosphorus after thickening or after dewatering. Um, I think after thickening it's not the problem because the, the reload of phosphorus by thickening is only a question of storage time. Uh, under anaerobic conditioning. Therefore, I suggest thickening, just fresh, no problem. And for dewatering, it could be a good idea to make uh, a reduction of phosphorus before dewatering, just in, in, um, in, um, to reduce all the trouble phosphorus can do by steward precipitation in the pipes and the pumps. Uh, so you can use the steward precipitation in advance uh, upstream of the dewatering to increase your watering and to reduce the return flow from the sludge liquor itself. And um, you can combine THP and phosphorus um, precipitation due to the fact if you have a higher degree of degradation in your anaerobic digestion, the, the phosphorate concentration will increase too. Not so uh, heavy like the ammonia concentration, but there is an influence on the release of phosphate as well. There is a one more question related to phosphorus again, uh, mm -hmm. because it, I think your slide made them to ask more questions. Uh, is soluble phosphorus contained an indicator of EPS development or does the soluble phosphorus also have a direct impact on sludge dewaterability and polymer consumption? This is a very, very good question, and I, I, I smile as I read it. <laughs> uh, so, so um, you have total phosphorus uh, as a part of the particle, phosphorus which is associated to the EPS, and phosphate which is quite real saluted. And at the state of research, we just try to make differentiate between the diluted phosphorus and the the associated phosphorus to the EPS as well. So there is not a clear answer, but we can only measure the, um, the soluble phosphorus and the total measure phosphorus. And we can't quantify the associated phosphorus. What we can quantify is the effect on the watering and the water binding. And I, um, there's some research necessary to get more, uh, more answers. But on the other hand, of course, if the EPS is related with phosphorus, you can see that if you make a precipitation, for example, not so effective, but possible, you use a ferric salt and you add it to the sludge. You see the, the effect on the watering not at, one, at once. You have to wait for a couple of hours to extract all these phosphate, these associated phosphates out of the um, EPS. And that's something our grandfathers knew in the 80s. If they have a chamber filter first with lime and ferric, they say, put on the ferric and wait a day, and then you can dewater it. So we, we are just um, to get a lot of answers and questions. But um, the, the, the necessary reaction time between a precipitation agent 
um, and the phosphorus removal must be related to the associated phosphate and EPS as well. Okay, uh, so I, uh, tell us, uh, now you can take the charge. Yeah. Uh, uh, because uh, the really uh, both of both the experts have answered lots of questions. So still some questions are there, but they are very uh, specific, and uh, it has to be that that answers will be given through emails and all. But uh, maybe they are asking very uh, some totally uh, generalized question. Uh, I really thank Dr. Bill Barber and Dr. Julia Pop for very nice uh, the question and answer session. So, and even participants have also asked a very interesting and very particular question, and which is added to the see, to my knowledge also some more addition to my knowledge also. Really thankful to the uh, both the experts for giving a specific answers to the question. Uh, over to Kailash sir. Thank you, Mr. Salvi. A special thanks to you also for uh, you know agreeing to take charge of this session. Uh, you know, it went off wonderfully well. As uh, Mr. Salvi was mentioning that we will try to answer any remaining questions that may be there, uh, you know, through emails, we will share the balance question with the experts and, you know, get them answered soon. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity again to, to thank uh, Dr. Julia Kopp and Dr. Bill Barber for taking time out of their schedules and, you know, sharing their knowledge and information uh, with us. I am sure the audience has found this very relevant and, you know, we look forward to more such sessions. Uh, 